Welcome to AWS Educate on Twitch. This is a second, the second part of a four-part series on getting started on AWS and welcoming you into the fabulous and exciting world of cloud computing. Um, I'm Ken Eisner, the global lead for AWS Educate, Amazon's global program to provide students and teachers around the world with the resources that they need to get involved in this world. And you are? And I'm Leo Jadnowski. I am a principal solutions architect here at AWS uh, and the public sector team. Fantastic. Um, before I get into a quick recap of episode one with Leo, I'm going to first tell you a couple key things. Go to aweseducate.com and you can sign up for free for the AWS Educate program. It will give you access to a lot of content and resources that you can use to do some of the cool things Leo is going to be doing today. And use promo code TWITCH2018, T-W-I-T-C-H 2018 in the promo code spot and you'll get extra resources on AWS. Second thing, ask questions, make comments into the chat forum, and our wonderful moderators over there will be shooting those questions over at us during the show. Please do them throughout. Um, Leo, could you go into the work that we did last week mm -hmm. around a static website? A nice recap for our audience. Yeah, so just to recap, uh, last week we talked about what a static website was compared to like a dynamic website and how you would set that up. So uh, last week we talked about using S3, which is our simple storage service. Uh, and you, so you can use that to store objects of any kind, in, including uh, you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. And uh, we set up a simple website using S3. So it was a snakes game, um, just simple HTML5 based game. Uh, and we set up in an S3 bucket. So we created an S3 bucket, we uploaded the content for the snakes game, and we also, uh, looked at how do you make a S3 bucket serve a website. So the default behavior in S3 is that it's private, so we have to change that. And how do you uh, set the bucket policy on the S3 bucket? Uh, so that's basically a summary of the work we did last week. So after last week, we had a static website with a game in it that you could easily access. Fantastic. So Leo also went into the AWS management console. Mm -hmm. you know, first, he helped walk through setting up an AWS account mm -hmm. or the AWS starter account, which is a no credit card required account that's part of the AWS Educate program, um, and then dove into a whole lot of the components that were inside of that the console so that you can walk through those introductory steps. It's one of the, the basic things in getting started, but everybody asks these questions. That you know, that walk through the creation of that static website is available um, on a link that the moderators are going to throw into your chat window now. So anytime you want to come back and access that link, you can do so. All right, today we're going to go into the notion of using AWS Lambda, using uh, Cloud9, creating architectural diagrams. Um, Leo, explain to me what what a dynamic website yeah. is. So traditionally, uh, a dynamic website, uh, first of all, what it means is that uh, you go to the website, uh, there's typically some kind of storage involved. So it's either like a database, like MySQL or, or Postgres or SQL Server or something. Um, and, uh, or you could use a NoSQL database like Mongo or DynamoDB, which is our product. Um, and so you have data that's stored. So that could be like a session, that could be your username and password. Um, it could be like your profile, anything that needs to persist between you logging in on, out of the website and you closing the web browser and reopening it again. Uh, and there's typically in a dynamic website also code that gets executed, it's called on, on the server side, right? So the server is executing some kind of code. So for example, it figures out, oh, you've logged in, so I'm gonna show you your content because this is uh, your username and this is what you, your preferences are. So that all happens on the server side. What we did last week, it was a static website in that there's nothing, the server is just serving up the HTML code. And there was actually code being executed with JavaScript, but that happens on your web browser, so it's client side. And traditionally, when you set up a dynamic website, you think of something like WordPress or Drupal, like a CMS, for example, a content management system. And so for those, you need uh, a load balancer. 
uh, if you're setting it up in you know kind of a production sort of um, architecture. So and a load balancer does what? So a load balancer, basically, when you have more than one web server, the load balancer distributes the traffic to, to those servers. So it could be two, it could be 100, it could be 1,000, right? It depends on how you set it up. But basically, uh, you when your web browser talks, talks to the load balancer, the load balancer then sends that request from your web browser to one of the servers behind it. And those servers typically, so you've got your web or application servers, and then they have a database that they talk to. So again, all the persistent data is typically stored in the database. And so the database has its own, you have to typically set it up to be, you know, either multi, is it going to AWS? You have to set up to scale and be highly available. So you've got a three-tier architecture, load balancer, web app server, and database server. Great. Typically. And so um, we have a elastic load balancer or ELB yep. on, a, or yep. on AWS. Yeah, we have, uh, for web servers, you would, typically do EC2 instances and you can set up auto scaling to scale them up and down. And for relational databases, uh, you would do uh, RDS. RDS is a relational database service and it supports different backends like MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, SQL Server. Great, great. All right, could you walk people mm -hmm. into the creation of your first dynamic element? Yeah, so actually what I'm gonna do here, we're not gonna cover uh, you know, uh, dynamic, uh, like your traditional three-tier web architecture mm -hmm. today. We'll do that in a future episode. But what we're going to cover today is called AWS Lambda. So Lambda is our serverless compute service. So what Lambda allows you to do is you take a piece of code, right, and um, you that code could be it supports different languages like uh, Java and Python, and we just added PowerShell support. There's other languages. So you take one of those a piece of code that's written in one of those languages, and you don't have to provision a server. Uh, you really just upload the code, and then you can execute the code. You can do that on a schedule. You can do that based off of like a web request, which is what we'll be doing. Uh, you can do it based uh, so that's event driven. So for example, somebody uploads a picture into S3 and you can have a trigger that causes a Lambda function to get executed and it'll like create a thumbnail of that image. There seems to be this great buzz around serverless mm -hmm. computing lately, yeah. right? So there really, uh, I think the nice thing about, there, there's several nice things about serverless computing and Lambda specifically. Mm -hmm. So A, there's no servers to manage. You just write your code and upload it and execute it um, and it, it's built to scale to your needs. So that function could be executed once, it could be executed a hundred times at this, in parallel, it'll still work, right? You don't have to set up like auto scaling or anything like that. It also has sub-second metering. So you get build per 100 millisecond execution time. So uh, what that means is uh, basically my Lambda function runs and I've paid for you know how long it was executed, and then when it finishes, I'm not paying for it anymore, down to 100 milliseconds. So it's very granular billing, um, and also the way it's set up because it's event driven. Um, it's it's not like a server where you pay for when it's on. For a lambda, you just pay for when it's utilized. So if I have a server and that server is just sitting there and it's on all the time, I'm paying for it even though no one's using it. Lambda, I'm only paying for it when I'm actually using this, it. This is part of the way the cloud is changing mm -hmm. things, right? Yeah. You know, in the old days, the notion of just paying for yeah, an event-driven service mm -hmm. doesn't even make sense yeah. today it's absolutely essential to the cloud. Yeah, and there's all kinds of use cases with Lambda, like because it's event-driven, uh, it plugs into a bunch of our different services, so Kinesis, S3, uh, CloudWatch events. We're not gonna cover all of them today, but you can do all kinds of cool use cases awesome. with Lambda. Awesome, and I'm sure that there's lots of examples. I'm sure you know, yeah. the moderators, if you could throw um, the Lambda homepage into mm -hmm. the chat window. Yeah, additionally, it will probably yeah. direct you to some of those cool yeah. use cases and services. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's build something. Yeah. So let's let's we're gonna build a basic like hello world type application. Um, so if you could share my screen. Um, so what I have up here on the screen is so this is Cloud Nine. So Cloud9, just really quickly, is our, our uh, product that is a uh, cloud uh, uh, ID. So it's a cloud development environment, right? So basically what that means is uh, this is web browser based. Mm -hmm. So I can access this from basically anything that has a web browser in it. It has a bunch of cool features that it has, you know, it's a full blown editor, it has a command line interface in it, um, and it has really cool integration with Lambda, which is why I'm using it today. This, this by, you know, Cloud9 is always talked mm -hmm. about by, you know, by teachers and educators is such a, you know, phenomenal use. It, mm -hmm. it gives a great developing environment. Um, yep. For you, makes it can make it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So, so what I'm going to do here is uh, 
I'm going to create a new Lambda function. So I'm going to go to this AWS Resources tab on the side here. And I'm going to click this is this button. This is the symbol for Lambda. So it's, it's for creating a new Lambda function. And I'm going to give my function a name. So I'm going to say, hello world. So I've given a name. And now I have to pick, um, there's blueprints. So if I want to just build one from scratch, I can just pick one of the empty blueprints and I'll just have an empty function. Uh, in this case, I want to you know, use an existing blueprint. So I'm going to pick what runtime I want. So this supports uh, Node.js and Python. So I'm going to do Python. And I'm going to do this Hello World uh, Python mm -hmm. 3. Um, and so uh, again, you can configure a trigger because it's event driven. I'm not going to do that in this case, but you could, you could do that here. And I'm going to just choose the default settings for memory and role generation and everything like that. So it's just confirming my settings, and I'm going to hit uh, finish. So it's now created my function. So let's take a look here. So it's opened up the function. So this is the actual code of the function. So this is Python code. So basically, it's just going to spit out um, the values uh, of keys that you pass to it. So uh, before I have the function uh, actually deployed to Lambda to like our service, I want to run it locally uh, just to make sure that it works. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just copy some sample input for this function. Uh, and I'm going to click here, and I'm going to say run, run local. So this allows me to, this brings up a screen where I can run it local. Local means I'm running it inside of my Cloud9 instance. It's not actually, I'm not being charged for any execution time in, in Lambda yet. So now I'm just giving you, this is the data that I'm passing to the Lambda function. So I'm giving it three keys with three different values. Mm -hmm. right? And I'm going to hit run. And so it's executing. So let's minimize this window here. So uh, let me just run it again so we get more of the results displayed here. So basically, the way that it works is it's given me a response. So it gave me the value, value one. So and if we look at the code, what it's doing is it's returning key, the key one. So it's returning the first key value, which is exactly what it did. Mm -hmm. And then you can also see here's the function logs. So this is just the logs from when it was executing. So everything worked. Right. So the cool thing right. here is, um, again, I'm just running it in my Cloud9 editor. And so now what I'm going to do is I want to actually run it remotely. So I want to run it, it. It also deployed this function into actually in, into Lambda. And so uh, what you can do is you can, uh, if you hit this button, It'll uh, deploy the selected Lambda function. And then once you deploy it, you can run it uh, remotely. Um, so then I would just choose Lambda remote, and it would do the same thing, except it would execute it inside the Lambda service. Great. Great. Yeah. So oh. yeah, go ahead. Oh, no. So we have a question from, uh, from the board. Mm -hmm. Are there, uh, and I don't know who asked this question, mm -hmm. but um, in regards to version control, uh, logging, and monitoring, how mm -hmm. is that handled within Lambda? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so for version control, typically I would recommend storing the code for your Lambda function in a version control repository, like some kind of Git repo, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll show you in a second how they're typically stored in like something like GitHub, or we have a service called Code Commit, which is a, a managed Git repository. So I would store them in Git. In terms of logging and monitoring, that is a great question. So uh, if I go to, I'm going to switch over to my Lambda management console here. And so this lists all of my Lambda functions, right? right? So this is the web console. And so this is the function that we just deployed mm -hmm. so 48 seconds ago. So uh, for monitoring, uh, there's a monitoring tab over here. And so this shows me uh, how many, so I had this one invocation of it. That's when I just ran it a second ago. And uh, there's no errors, so it was availability 100%. So Good this job. is a bunch of metrics. Right. And then for logging, um, you can view the logs in CloudWatch. Uh, so what this is going to do is this actually shows the output of my Lambda function. Um, so this is uh, the output of value 1 equals 1. So this is the same output that I got in Cloud9. So it, all the output when you execute it in Lambda is stored in CloudWatch logs. Okay. So that's so we've covered monitoring, logging, and Fantastic. version control as well. Great, great. So, talk to, I know that you have a an education customer of yours mm -hmm. yep. um, uses uh, Lambda. Uh, I believe it's Blackboard, right? Yes. Yeah, Talk so, about so uh, I used to be uh, uh, the solutions architect for Blackboard. And Blackboard, for those of you that know, they're an uh, education software company. Uh, they make a bunch of products, including uh, Learn. So Learn is a learning management system. Uh, and so 
It's a just yeah. just for everybody's mm-hmm. background. A learning management system is used by you know, almost all of the higher education and, and K twelve organizations. Obviously, mm-hmm. Blackboard's a very prolific provider mm-hmm. of learning management systems. Our LMSs mm-hmm. that actually you know, are that key way that a teacher you know controls their or manages their learning environment inside their classroom. Yeah, and and so. The LMS is based in a web browser, right, primarily. So they have to make sure that their system works across different platforms, so Mac and Linux and Windows mm-hmm. and different browsers like Firefox and Chrome uh, and all that. And so um, traditionally what you do is you do UI testing for that, mm-hmm. right? And it, some people do it manually, so they just have somebody look at you know your web pages in a, in a browser, in a bunch of different browsers. And traditionally, you do it like after that, you could do it. There's automated ways to do it. So they were doing it with a software called Selenium, which is open source uh, software, Selenium web driver. And uh, so the problem was they used to do it on actual servers, and it took I think um, even after they optimized it like 18 minutes or so per run. And they switched it, so they they got Selenium running in Lambda. So now they're doing their UI testing as part of their continuous integration process. So basically every time there's a code change, that triggers a UI test. Ah, And now instead of taking like 18 minutes, I think it takes around 30 seconds per test. Fantastic. Um, So it's become easier, uh, it's become more cost effective um, because of Lambda. Yeah, love how Blackboard's innovating on AWS. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, there's another, yeah, another customer. Certainly, mm-hmm. one of the most prolific, you know, customers mm-hmm. on the web. Netflix uses yes. Lambda. How do they use it? So Netflix uses Lambda's event-driven uh, functionality uh, for a bunch of different use cases. And so uh, one of them is, for example, validating backups. So uh, they have backups, I'm sure, for things like databases and the contents of their web servers and all that. And so every time you take a backup, that's great. But you want to make sure that if you ever have to use that backup in case your server crashes or you know you lose some data somehow. Uh, the backup's actually valid. So they have to validate the backup. So anytime a backup finishes, they trigger, they use Lambda uh, to trigger a, a validation process to make sure the backup is valid. Um, they also do things uh, like um, for video transcoding that can be triggered by Lambda. So let's say a new video drops in S3 bucket, you could trigger a transcoding job to you know, transcode it to a different resolution or for a different device. Uh, you can trigger that with Lambda. And uh, for the Netflix one, there's actually, if you, uh, we'll put out the link uh, on the chat, uh, but there's a, uh, a whole video where one of their uh, people talks about exactly how, how they do this event driven stuff. A couple questions from, mm-hmm. uh, from people out there. Uh, first, from uh, PND uh, Bedard, what languages are supported by Lambda? Okay, so uh, let's see if I get them uh, all right without looking at a uh, browser. <laughs> so it supports Python, uh, it supports Go, uh, it supports .NET Core, uh, it supports Java and JavaScript, and I believe we just added a PowerShell last week to it. So. So, ladies and gentlemen at home, you feel free to check out, see if uh, Leo's yeah, answers were 100% anything. correct, yeah. <laughs> and f- provide feedback into the chat button. Um, second question came from um, ITRHME. Is Lambda more complicated than using EC2? Right, so that's a good question. So, Lambda, in terms of actually just putting up a function and running it, I would say is easier than EC2 because you don't have to spin up an instance, you don't have to worry about how the networking is set up, the security groups are all that. So in, in many ways it's easier because you just write some, you can focus on your code and executing that code. In some ways though, it's, just, it's different, right? Uh, because serverless is a newer thing, the way you architect serverless, and you typically use like uh, API gateway, which I'll show you in a second, and um, uh, Lambda itself and DynamoDB. So it's, it's a different type of architecture than your traditional like three tier web architecture. So it's different. So if you're used to setting up, you know, your traditional uh, instance or server-based architecture, it's going to be, uh, there's going to be some differences. I wouldn't say it's harder though. But yeah, to, if you want to you know, write a piece of code from scratch and get it from being written to being executed right. to being uh, it, you know, in a way where you could do it in production, I would say Lambda's a lot easier. Fantastic. Um, we asked um, Leo a bunch of other questions last week. I'll rehash mm-hmm. some. Mm-hmm. You know, is uh, Star Wars or Star Trek? Um, he came through with Star Trek. <laughs> um, and he was also... Um, 
you know, asked about the wonderful, uh, the, the sartorial splendor or the, the jacket he was wearing last week. Um, would you care to share um, where? Yeah, it's actually jacket? the same uh, brand of jacket as last week. It's called Suit Supply. Uh, yeah, it's just different, different I, color. I, I, I'm just you know assuming that those <laughs> questions would be asked. All right, let, let's go into something um, more complex, building yeah. something yeah, yeah. more so, dynamic. So this lambda function, which is built, is great, but it's if we look at the code again, it's very simple. It's not actually interacting with any data source. It's just spitting out data that we give it to it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to build something dynamic that's based off of, um, of the web, right? So we're not just executing this function. Um, and so I, I was trying to think of a good example. So there's actually something called the serverless application repository. And so the serverless application repository, um, it is our repository of different sample Lambda-based applications that you can use. And so as you can see, there's like Alexa skills in there, all kinds of examples. Um, and th these are actually, a lot of these are written uh, by just uh, contributors in the community uh, that use Lambda. And so I, I found one that I like that's a to-do list. It's a serverless to-do list. Um, so, uh, hey, hey um, yeah. by the way, I'm just remembering yeah. because I know we have people coming in and out mm -hmm. of these shows. I just wanted to do a, a super quick recap of you know what we've uh, shared today mm -hmm. as it gets into this more dyna dynamic bill with um, the to-do list. Um, we went through a quick recap of what we did mm -hmm. last week in terms of creating a static website. That video is available. Mm -hmm. on um, that, that video is available and can be shared, you know, has been shared and will be shared again mm -hmm. by our moderators. We went into um, building out the first, you know, what is a dynamic uh, website? You know, what are some mm -hmm. of those things that need to be done to make your website more dynamic? And began going into um, an explanation of AWS Lambda and the and using Cloud9 uh, with starting out basic, and now we're going to do something a little more dynamic. Yep. So uh, this is the serverless to-do list, and as you can see, the, it's uh, built by somebody uh, who is hosting it in a, actually a GitHub repository, and so I'm just going to go hit deploy, and so this will take me to the AWS console, and so it's going to just tell me what permissions it's going to use. Uh, it's using a CloudFormation template. Um, and so uh, basically, I just have to provide a parameter. So um, give it an application name. So I'm going to give it a name, service to do list uh, demo. And I'm going to hit deploy. And so what this is doing is this is actually deploying a CloudFormation template. And if we look at the architecture of this uh, application is, um, and here it's gone to the next screen. So. Uh, it's, it's still deploying, so it's going to show me the deployment status. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way that it works is it's using uh, Lambda. It's using uh, Node.js uh, for the language. Uh, it's using API Gateway. So let me talk a little bit about what API Gateway is. Great. Uh, so API Gateway uh, is basically a, a product that we have. So you have an endpoint. So you have like a URL that you can go to, and there's different uh, paths on the URL. So you can go like slash is the default path, mm -hmm. and slash, let's say, you know, add user is another path. So you can redirect each of those different paths to different microservices, right? So uh, basically what that means is um, each microservice can be either a Lambda function or several Lambda functions, or it can be go to a load balancer, like an ELB with instances behind it. So you can build an API uh, to do different things. And so ELB, the API, again, is uh, yeah. Elastic Load Balancer. I know yeah. we went through that. So the just. API gateway just basically routes traffic mm -hmm. uh, between different uh, microservices in the back end. It also supports uh, authentication and throttling and all kinds of really nice features there. So uh, my application is actually, it's, mm -hmm. it's almost done deploying. The other thing that it's using is DynamoDB. So DynamoDB is our, um, it's our NoSQL data store. So what that means is you create a table. Uh, there's no like servers to provision or anything. You just create a table and you can start putting data in that table and you, uh, to get the performance you need to scale, you just give it a uh, re read and write throughput. So how much you, you wanted to, how much read and write capacity you want to have. And you pay based on how much data you store and uh, how much throughput you've provisioned. Now it also has auto scaling. So if you don't want to have to pre-provision it, you can just uh, configure it to automatically scale your tables up and down uh, or the capacity up and down, right? And so, um, 
that is the basic architecture of this app. So we, it's actually been successfully deployed, but we have to do a few steps here. So let's go to the directions here. So the first thing we want to do is go to the API Gateway Console. We're just going to have to change some settings. Um, so this is the API Gateway Console, and this is my uh, API that I just configured. And so I'm going to click on it. And so the first thing it wants me to do is to go to uh, settings and add a binary type. So that's these binary media types. And so this is uh, just to enable the functionality of this application. So I'm going to go ahead and I, I went and added it. So I did that. Uh, and then it wants me to go to resources and uh, deploy this change that I just made. So I'm going to go to resources here. Uh, and then it wants me to go to, let's see, yeah, resources, actions, uh, deploy API. So I'm going to go ahead and deploy this. So that's now being deployed. Uh, and so now what I can do is I'm going to go to the dashboard. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this gives me, this is like the URL for my actual API. And so here's my to-do list. Let me make it a little bit bigger. So that's it. So we now have an application. So let's see. I'm going to add groceries to my to-do list. I'm going to add uh, find new Star Trek. <laughs> on Fire TV. And so yeah, so it's storing all of these okay. in a table. So this is a fully fledged application, which right. is really cool. We deployed it in what, like a Very three cool. minutes. Um, and uh, it, it, it looks really nice. And uh, it's a really easy way to get it started. So yeah, let's take should. a look at, so now we have two functions. We have mm -hmm. my hello world function. And we have my function that's uh, uh, doing this to-do list. And again, if we go here, we can actually see, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. Uh, so we can see this is uh, uh, my function. And then it's triggered by API Gateway, and then it logs to CloudWatch Log. So you can see the inputs to this function and, and the, the outputs. outputs. And then you can see the actual code here. Great. Um, and so I'm not going to go through the code too much, but this is just the, the code um, for the function. Um, so yeah, so it's using API Gateway, it's using Lambda, and if I go to DynamoDB, it's storing this in a DynamoDB. You, so I think you can see, you know, as all these things interact, how mm -hmm. much yeah, more complexity you can add, but how you can do it simply and quickly. Yeah. Um, so that's great. We've got some questions great. from the crowd. Um, the first is... Um, from ITRHME, can I use third-party Python packages with Lambda, mm -hmm. Lambda if they're not part of that base configuration? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You can uh, you can uh, include any kind of third-party packages. Um, you basically zip them up into a zip file, and, I th and there's a file where you include you tell it what to include uh, in our docs for Lambda, which we can throw out a link to. Uh, there's there's a procedure for doing that. Great. Um, second question is around our free tier. Mm -hmm. um, from Death Fighter, Fighter X, is it possible to host a very small website using the AWS uh, uh, the, the free tier? Yes, uh, that is a great question. So, um, if you're hosting, let's take a look at the condition, uh, some of the things you get with our free tier, right? So. For S3, you get five gigabytes uh, of storage. That's, I would say, more than a, a mm -hmm. small website. So you can store all that in S3 bucket for a year. Um, you also um, you get uh, EC2 instances, so 750 hours of, a, I believe, like a T2 micro instance. So if you want to host your website on an instance, you can just put up a, um, a T2 micro for a year and host it on that. Um, and I believe you get some bandwidth for free as well. I have to look up how much it is. But totally. yeah, so you can definitely host a small website for Great. free. So I mean, they'll, they'll publish the free tier. Mm -hmm. Um, details or the, the link on the website. One thing about the free tier is that is available at sign up. Actually, if you sign up for AWS Educate, you use that Twitch 2018 promo code. Um, as long as you're a student and you need to use, uh, we do recommend using your .edu email address as long as you have one, mm -hmm. um, you get you can also gain access to that free tier. The free tier does expire after 12 months mm -hmm. worth of use. It is available for that yeah. first year. Next question. Um, can you store more uh, by Sarab, uh, Sarabjeet? Um, can you store more than 400 uh, kilobytes with DynamoDB. Uh, that I don't know off the top of my head, so we'll have to look it up and we can drop it in the chat. Yeah. Um, second one. Uh, let me see. Uh, like for 
and it's from the same uh, same person. Mm -hmm. Lake for SQS, um, Simple Q service, uh, AWS SDK has extended client for items more than 256 uh, kilobytes to store yep. in S3. I uh, wonder so, if yeah, you we'll, had the same, the same Yeah, the we'll, same we'll have question. to look that up. Yeah, I okay. don't know the limits off the top of my head. Great. Okay. We've gone into um, that Hello World application and mm -hmm. doing the to-do list yep. to make your website more dynamic. Now let's take a step back. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so you are a solution architect. Yeah. You're doing cloud architecture mm -hmm. for customers that use AWS. Mm -hmm. You may be developing a diagram. You may be walking them through mm -hmm. their issues. To do diagramming, yeah. where do you begin? So uh, typically when I first meet with a customer, we just whiteboard it out. So we just use a whiteboard, right, and a marker, and, and that's like the initial drawing. But then after that, you want to get something on paper, so to speak, right, and you want to make it look nicer. Um, so you typically use, a, there's a bunch of software products out there to do um, to do architecture drawings or diagrams. Um, so, you know, for example, there's Lucichart and Omnigraphal and Vizia there. What I'm to show you today is called Cloudcraft. And so Cloudcraft, uh, the really nice thing about it is uh, it is a totally uh, um, it, it is uh, totally web browser based, mm -hmm. so I don't have to have any software installed on my uh, computer. And the other nice thing about it is that it has uh, it can actually it has something called Live, so you can actually plug it into your AWS account, and it can diagram out like what you already have running, oh, cool. which I'm not going to do today, but you can do that. And so what we typically do is um, so there's actually a pre-built library here, mm -hmm. so you can start with one of these libraries. So uh, for example, this is a web app reference architecture. And the other thing I like about this is these diagrams are all like 3D, so they're actually interesting to look at. They're not flat. Um, and so, uh, for example, this shows kind of the 3D web architecture I was talking about earlier. So we've got, um, you know, this is the user, and they are going to a load balancer, mm -hmm. and then there's an a, a auto scaling group of uh, web servers. And then there's another load balancer and an auto scaling group of application servers. And then there's a database, like a MySQL database in the background. So typically, uh, when I meet with customers, we draw out something like this to represent either what they're thinking of building uh, or, or what, they're, uh, what we're recommending for them to build. And uh, for example, there's a serverless one here too. And so this is a Lambda function. So here I'm a user. I I've, I've vote uh, you know, some kind of contest using um, API Gateway. So I talk to API Gateway just like I did with my to-do list. That triggers a Lambda function, uh -huh. uh, which routes the request. Uh, it, it writes the vote in a DynamoDB table. That triggers another Lambda function, which tallies the vote and stores the vote totals in S3. So this is a, just a sample architecture. Um, what you can do is uh, you can actually uh, create a new blueprint and you can start from scratch. So, you, you know, for example, if I want to add an S3 bucket with objects in it, I put that here. Um, and then you can, you can label it. Um, so, you know, if, if none of the blueprints work for you, um, so I'm going to search for text box now. So let's say snakes. This is what we did last week. S3 bucket. And so, yeah, so eventually I can draw out a full architecture using this tool. Great. Which is pretty nice. So, so you know, through, the, through this, you can use template library mm -hmm. um, things are. You can customize those yep. te those templates, and you can build your own. Yeah, and this has uh, a lot of our services already in it. So, for example, Lambda it has all the icons for it. Um, you know, uh, elastic right. load balancer. You think of it; it's probably here. So, we also actually have a icon set online, so we can post the link to that. Uh, but you can download the, all the icons for our services, so then you can use whatever software you want to uh, draw out your architecture diagram. Fantastic. Yeah. The, the deeper age, I mean, I think we find you yeah. know, people at a younger age or mm -hmm. introductory tend to make more mistakes by not going through this diagramming process. Well, it just, right? it's, it's useful to diagram it out because uh, before you actually start putting hands on a keyboard, you think about what services am I going to use? Uh, how do those services work? Um, how do we architect them? How, where's the data going to flow between them? You know, that leads to like thinking, how are we going to secure the, these services? Right. What settings do we need to set up? Um, so whereas if you just start like working without drawing it out, uh, you, you kind of discover these things the hard way sometimes. And uh, also it just, you know, 
you, you end up like I think spending a lot more time just uh, experimenting with, with things that may or you you may have found out wouldn't work or other architectures would have worked better beforehand. Great, great. As we're working through this, we want to make sure we also give you guys best practices mm -hmm. so that you're going to be able to yeah. hit Leo's um, skill levels uh, <laughs> as you go. Um, quick question from a student um, uh, from uh, PCI SNERP. Mm -hmm. um, as a student, can I create a a group of work, you know, a group of students mm -hmm. um, with using the free tiers, and then assign different tasks to each. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I'd have to dive in on what uh, specifically the project is. But yeah, you can have in AWS, you have a system called IM, which is Identity right. Access Management. So you can have multiple users connecting to the same account. Um, if they're, you know, for example, writing a piece of code, you can actually use Cloud9, which we had before, and you can share the same Cloud9 environment with multiple students. Um, you can, you know, spin up, for example, like a EC2 instance. Uh, you can give a bunch of students access to it and give them folders. You can give everybody their own S3 buckets. So yeah, you know, what we'd have to drill down into every service, right. but yes, there are definitely ways to um, have multiple students or a team of students work on the same project. In Fantastic. The same and you, uh, the great thing about it is you can also give different permission levels mm -hmm. based yeah. to you know, different IAM users. Um, all right, so as a recap, mm -hmm. um, we, you know, today, we, again, you know, recapped what we did last week mm -hmm. when we set up, uh, had people set up, or yep. actually you set up a static website. Yep. Then we started to go into building a site more dynamic by adding mm -hmm. Lambda functions, showing, showcasing what could be done with Cloud9, setting up a Hello World application, mm -hmm. setting up a to-do function yep. using Lambda, um, and then going deeper into architectural diagrams. To, to remind everybody, again, you can go to AWS Educate, use the Twitch 2018 promo code in order to get $100 in free you know, free access into AWS, either through AWS account or an AWS Educate starter account. Um, we will be back. Yes. Um, we'll be back in a couple weeks, October 2nd, mm -hmm. um, with our third show as yep. we build on top of yes. the work that's already been done. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thank you to Leo. Yeah. Um, thank you to everybody out there who asked questions um, and made this a more you know, as interactive as possible. Mm -hmm. We want to continue to add to that, continue to listen to, um, to any feedback that's also been added through the chat window and give you a really interactive environment as we help you scale up to building your own um, very cool websites. Thanks again. Um, we really we appreciate. It. Come back, tune again on October second, or you know, check out the the AWS HK and Twitch page for that next time. Um, look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, everyone.